Thank you everyone for coming today for the, uh, our final public event for our Thinking 3D ex exhibition. Uh, today we have the honor of welcoming Dr. Holly Tucker, Mellon Foundation Chair for the Humanities, Professor of French, and Director of the Robert Penn Warren Center for the Humanities here at Vanderbilt. Dr. Tucker received her PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and has been here at Vanderbilt since 1996. Is that correct? <laughs> she has published many scholarly articles and received many awards, including the Chancellor's Award for Research in 2012. She is the author of three acclaimed books on the history of medicine and science, including Pregnant Fictions, Blood Work, and most recently, City of Light, City of Poison. She has also been a great friend to the History of Medicine collections here for many years. And we are so thankful for Dr. Tucker to take time away from conferences and grants and the rest of the semester to talk to us today about anatomy and the early modern mind. You know, um, this is, it feels weird to have a microphone because they're a small little group, and I'm looking, there are only a few people I don't know here. Um, it's your fan club! I know! In, in fact, Liders. what's that? <laughs> I mean, can I turn this down a little bit? How do I? I think so. Yeah. You can't do Oh, I can't do Okay. okay. Well, first what I want to do is um, thank you all for being here and thank you for including me. Um, and it's a real treat to um, talk in this room because I've spent many, many hours here and I've sent even more students here, even recently, just um, yesterday in class I had a student give a presentation on the history of cookbooks. Um, she came over to the, to the um, exhibit and then worked with Chris um, to dig a little bit more and it was, she said that it was, unforgettable the chance to be able to hold these 16th and 17th century herbals from Capayas and cookbooks. But this, um, I want to talk, I, I, let me give just a, a precursor because I also know that we have a few physicians and surgeons in the room. I am a doctor, but I don't know much about modern brains. Um, I know more about how brains were understood in the, um, from antiquity to the 17th century and more about the philosophical um, discussions that go around how people see brains, what they think about them, um, what they don't want to think about when they see brains. And I'm struck by um, um, everything that the exhibit's been doing already, the 3D aspects, right? And some of the high-tech as aspects of, of the exhibit. And you know, we really are in this moment of the neurocentry, right? It's everything that we do seems to be attached to the brains, how we move, how we think, um, who we are, what we are, um, where, where our moral failings may be, what crimes we may end up committing, you know, projection, projections depending on, on the anatomy and physiology of, of the brain. And in many ways, it's a type of modern predeterminism that we may be seeing for all of the right scientific reasons. Um, but it's true that the brain is larger than oneself. Um, the brain represents both now and in earlier periods, the brain represents um, not only the individual, but also the place of the individual in the society, as well as contemporary thinking, whether it's um, society, culture, religion, even economic, philosophical types of modes of thinking. But to say plainly, before the 17th century, the brain didn't exist, um, at least not the way we thought about the brain now. Um, and definitely, the types of questions that we ask about the brain look at once very unusual, perhaps exotic, even laughable, but in many ways, as I'd like to um, end my talk, in many ways, some of the quest uh, toward the brain, as we move deeper toward the scientific revolution, um, the, the stakes are just as high um, as it was for them, as it is for now. Um, so what I want to do is to get at the idea of what a brain is in the, uh, in the early modern period. And when I say early modern period, I'm talking between 16th century and 18th century. But when we talk about the early modern period, we're also talking about antiquity. Aristotle, Hippocrates, Plato, Galen. And really, when we talk about a brain, it asks us to get to the very heart of what we do. And the reason why the brain didn't exist is because what really mattered in the early modern period was the heart. That's where intelligence lay. 
Um, but it didn't mean that the, that the brain was not in some way um, um, useful. Um, because we do have, what the, what the main focus was in the early modern period were these empty holes in the brain, right? The ventricles, um, or what were perceived as empty holes in the brain. And that's where certain amounts of, of knowledge came. And so here we can have, we can see a 13th century example, and then also a 16th century example. And I know that this one's on exhibit, right? Yep. Um, and so this right here is a uh, lasting idea of how the brain works. It works primarily with a focus on ventricles, and it's in those ventricles that either cognition, memory, or the very soul live. Um, for Aristotle, the five senses, senses come together in the head, um, and he calls this sensus communis, um, the common sensory input that allows us to have images to be formed. And you can see this. This is, you know, in the ventricles you have these sort of modes of, of knowing, modes of knowledge, cognition. Um, later on, it will be modes of the soul. And in here, in the right um, image, um, from the back to the front, you have the cell in the back, which is for the imaginative faculty. For the center, it's rational thinking. And then in the, in the front is the faculty of memory. That's about all we know, right? Um, but largely, that, those functions are coming from a much more complicated process that will um, end up coming through the heart. But before I get there, so um, you've probably throughout the exhibit seen this um, image many, many times. Um, so Da Vinci actually likens the brain in, um, to an onion. If you'll cut an onion through the middle, you'll be able to see and enumerate all of the coats or rinds which circularly clothe the center of the onion. Similarly, if you will cut through the middle of the head of a man, you will first cut through hairs, then the scalp, then the muscular flesh, then the pericranium, then the cranium, um, and inside the dura mater, the peter mater, pia mater, and the brain, then the rete mirabile, and then the bone, their foundation. So here's where we start to get to questions of, of um, the heart and the brain. So we have here, this is a later image from Vesalius, and I'll talk about Vesalius in a bit, um, in a few minutes. But you have this area up at the, at the base of the skull. Let me uh, not touch the screen. Um, at, the, at the base of the skull, skull which is the rete mirabile. So it's the miraculous um, network or the miraculous net. And according to Galen, so Galen would be 5th century AD, um, really the founding father with Hippocrates of medicine that will endure all the way through the 18th century. And in fact, for us to get to modern, more modern notions of the brain, we actually have to get rid of this model entirely. And that's when we move forward, we'll talk a little bit about Thomas Willis and what Willis completely um, eschews the notion of, of humors and, um, and um, Galen. So what that is, is you have, you have the heart, um, and you have the different uh, blood vessels, right, the arteries um, and the veins. And ostensibly, according to Galen, what would happen is the blood would move up to this miraculous net, and there it would be purified. Um, some, in some models, it was really blood. In other models, it was vital spirits for this ethereal um, uh, air-like thing that would then move up and get purified and move in, move in toward the brain. Um, over time, though, um, um, what developed is three different th three different types of souls or spirits, right? So for uh, Galen, Galen talks about vital spirit, and that's coming from the heart. It's being um, distilled out of the blood, the natural spirit, which is what allows. Uh, nutrition and um, and the development of, of, of uh, the movement of food and nutrition through the body that that's formed in the liver and then the animal spirit is in the brain and that lives right in the ventricles. Um, for for uh, Aristotle, however, there were three different souls: the vegetative soul, which is really the the force of, that allows the body to move. Right, all plants, all animals, and all humans have that. The sensitive soul. Um, which is what allows um, uh, the uh, organism to respond. Animals and humans have that. And then the rational soul is that, that force that allows us to have an understanding of things. And as we move through time in the early modern period, medieval and early modern period, of course, the rational soul 
is also the, the ability of the human being to rationalize and understand, appreciate, and have faith towards this larger being, which would be God. So it's really interesting here, um, because da Vinci um, completely says, I have a real big problem with this idea of the brain. I can some degree follow the brain's functions and dissections of living animals with sufficient probability and truth, but I'm unable to understand how the brain can pre perform its office of imagining, meditating, thinking, and remembering or following various doctrines. However you may wish to divide or enumerate the powers of your brain and soul. So da Vinci is getting into the brain and saying, I, I just don't get it. I truly don't get it. How can this, this mass um, with maybe these empty spaces actually be doing all that? Um, later on in the 17th century, in a quote that's often shared by Henry Moore, this lax pith or marrow in man's head shows no more capacity for thought than a cake of suet or a bowl of curds. Um, so this is what we're going to be seeing from the early modern period all the way to Willis, is saying, how can we make sense of this? And specifically, how can we make sense of this when we know that everything that matters is actually coming through the heart and the blood, right? Um, so I've, ta I've talked, since I've worked uh, on blood a lot, this is a model that um, I think I've, um, for me, seems really convincing. I think the more you tell it over and over again, and the more you get into the early modern mindset, the more it makes sense. So in Galen's mode of, of understanding, again, Galen is, is this main force of a of, of, of philosophical force about how bodies are understood, how they function, um, and then why they're healthy and why they're not healthy. So again, we're looking at Vesela's 16th century, but he here, not always, but he here is modeling um, Galenic modes of, of thought when it comes to the circulatory system. And you can tell we've got the lungs, but then we also have um, the stomach and the spleen, all I mean, you get basically of this, the main part of the body, and you wouldn't think that all of that should be involved with the circulatory system, but it is. According to Galen, um, blood was created in the, uh, through the process of digestion, right? So you literally were what you ate in a humoral theory. So you would eat something, it would end up getting churned around, concocted in the stomach, and then it would move to the liver where it becomes purified, right? And then the blood would, from that, so more purified version of what you ate, the blood would then move to the heart. Now, they were looking at valves, and they couldn't quite figure out what the valves did. Keep in mind that this is, we're not, we're not anywhere near um, circula circulation yet, right? So really the thought was is the valves were like little dikes, right, in a river that would keep um, the blood from all pulling down to the, uh, down to the feet. And so it would basically, uh, again, anachronistically, I guess, like a, le a little elevator, right? It would push the blood toward the heart. The heart was something of a furnace um, in the mindset. The blood would then be burned off in the heart, which would allow then the body to be heated. It would give the body um, movement. Um, and the only real connection between the heart and the mind came when there'd be something wrong with that system, right? Um, um, the heart was overheated, which caused vapors to go into the brain, which might cause delusions, right, or um, other forms of mental illness. Um, what were the lungs for then? There was absolutely no idea of that relationship between the lungs and the heart until the 18th century with Richard Lower's experiments. Um, who is all, who's going to be contemporary to most of the guys that I'm going to be talking about. Um, Richard Lower considered that, um, just, I'm sorry, Galen considered the lungs to be simply, you know, bellows to stoke the fire of the blood, making a one-way trip getting burned off. So all of this is also coming from a notion of humors, as I mentioned before. Um, everything that we do is based on this balance, who we are, how we act, how we feel. Each of us has this constitution, right? Some of us are going to be tending more towards um, cold and wet, more phlegm, right? Um, maybe more likely to get colds. Um, others may be more sanguine, they might be warmer, more full of energy. And it's that unique balance that we have. We have all four of, of these um, humors, yellow bile, blood, phlegm, black, black bile. When we talk about each of these, it's not necessarily the fluid itself, in and of itself, 
but it's also the, um, the qualities that it represents. And then depending on our unique makeup, when we're in balance, right, um, then everything is well. When we're not in balance, then we need to figure out a way to either change our food that we're eating, right, because blood is made out of food, and that's a small, I, I, I'm sorry, that's a long, a long-term change that you need to do, is you can't effect a change because it has to go through the whole digestive process. So another thing that it helps explain why they did bloodletting, right, that was sort of an, an immediate way, bloodletting, purging, enemas, you know, um, um, that would be an immediate way to get the balance back in, in, in the hopes that um, health would then return. So why is this important? All of this is important because for us to understand how the brain was, um, was perceived, we have to understand Galen. We also have to understand the heart because largely that's all that was taught, right? And so keeping also in mind that Galen himself never did, to our knowledge, any human dissections which helps us understand the reti mirabile, right? Because humans don't have that, but some animals do. So he saw it in animals. And over time, over centuries, what would happen is there'd be, there'd be exhibits starting um, in the Middle Ages. Contrary to popular belief, it was never considered to be outlawed by the Catholic Church to do dissections. It was just tightly, tightly controlled. With the rise of, of medical schools in the 13th century, the Catholic Church was um, very much linked to that process of instruction, they did allow um, perhaps one dissection a year, right? Um, um, now that didn't mean that that was that would provide enough bodies for somebody like um, like Leonardo, right? But d dissection was not outlawed. Here gives an idea. Now, of course, this is apocryphal, but it gives an idea of what what um, in the cultural sphere how dissections were understood and what the various roles were. The dead guy's role is clear, right? Um, you can tell here, just by his clothing, um, that he's, he's likely a barber, right? A barber surgeon. He's there to do the dirty work. Here's clearly the, um, the uh, physician, the teacher, the professor. And you can tell that what he's doing is he's instructing the, oh my goodness. Um, he's, in, he's instructing the surgeon um, what he should be doing, where he should be looking. But you can tell he's got a book in his hands. He's not taking notes. He's actually saying, Galen says that you will see this. So the purpose of a dissection was not discovery in the Middle Ages, right? A discovery, that will only happen once we get to the Renaissance. We'll move there in a second. It was really an affirmation of things that they already knew. And when we get to the Renaissance, things start to change. This is Vesalius, right? And we actually have, in addition here, is that one on display? Oh, that, that's, a, of course, yeah. Um, so and that one's a nice one because it's bound in boards and it's like unbelievable. But, um, so here we have the frontispiece of, of Vesalius' um, uh, work of art, um, uh, Humani Corporis, right? on the fabric of man. And um, you can see here where we had the original, um, the image of the first um, doctor sort of dictating. We actually have the Salius himself here in the center, right? He's doing the dissections. Why is he doing it? Because he's, he's not only um, um, demonstrating, you can tell there's lots of people looking around. This is, of course, an allegorical mode. Um, I do love the naked guy here. Right? Who's like, no, I don't want to be next. Yeah. Right? And then there, there are um, books upon books of the complexity, on the complexity of this um, allegorical image. But he's getting his hands dirty. And we have another um, a detail from a different plate. Vesalius really wants to get to the heart of the matter. He really wants to figure out um, if what, what Galen is saying is true. Now, just to remind you, as Galen is working from this idea of valves, he's thinking about this idea of a one-way trip. Um, here, of course, are some illustrations of da Vinci, who's also exploring some of the same questions. What happens, before I get to Harvey, what happens, Vesalius gets really annoyed. He can't find the Rete Mirabile. 
It, for, it in fact, is a bit complicated. First, he believes he sees it in that first drawing that I showed you, right, with the, the net that's actually from Vesalius. At first, he thinks he sees it, and then he goes a long period of time, several years, where he says, did I? I and he just can't find it, and it, it annoys him. And what is going to, as we get closer and closer to the brain, trust me, we are, um, what will happen is each moment, um, folks are getting more and more annoyed that they can't find the anatomical evidence for what Galen is telling them. Harvey is one of them. So going back to the blood, this idea that the blood would make a one-way trip, right? It would all be burned off. Galen, I'm sorry, Harvey in the 17th century now, just like Vesalius, is saying, you know, there's some stuff that's just not right here. And Harvey makes a very simple, simple experiment. What he does is he thinks, okay, if blood makes a one-way trip, um, all I really need to do is measure the amount of blood, right, in one of the chambers of the heart's heart, and then multiply that by the number of heartbeats over a given period of time, right? Um, and so he does a dissection, and he finds out that there's just an ounce or two of blood, multiplies it, and then he figures out how much food a person would have to eat, right? Um, how much blood by quantity would actually go through the human body at any given time, and then how much blood a person would have to eat. And it's a ridiculous amount, absolutely ridiculous. And he says, that can't be it. So Harvey goes back to the valves, and he says, all right, what are these valves for? Clearly, they're not the little, you know, the little dikes moving the blood out. And he starts to do um, vivisections on animals. First, he starts with small animals, rabbits, right? And gets frustrated because the hearts are being so fast, he really can't see what's going on. So then he moves to, um, to slow, uh, cold-blooded um, creatures like snakes. And he starts to understand that there's this dance, right, between the moving of the blood and the pumping of the heart, right, the, the, um, uh, the swelling, right, of the, of the artery and the pumping, right. And so he has this idea, and it's really just an idea. It's a hypothesis in 1628 that maybe blood is making a closed circuit, right. And it's, every time we mention like these great discoveries, you have to know that these discoveries are not like, oh, a, a person of genius, right? These are really people coming out of the Renaissance. They're beginning to question, right? The rebirth, the Renaissance. Um, they're starting to wonder, well, what does it mean? Um, can I take these, um, this knowledge of antiquity as articles of faith and fact? And he figures out that he can't. So he starts to do these really simple experiments, um, progressively horrific. Um, um, he and um, uh, Christopher Wren, uh, of course the big architect of uh, post-fire uh, London, he and Christopher Wren begin doing these infusion experiments where they begin infusing all sorts of things into the bodies of animals, whether it's blood, beer, opium, right? And the idea is that if it makes a one-way trip to the heart, then there shouldn't be any real lasting um, influence because one and done, it's burned off, right? And they discover that that's not the case. Christopher Wren actually stops doing medical experiments in 16, 1665 um, for fear that, so there was a servant, they tied down a servant and then put um, opium in the servant um, through syringes. Syringes were invented for these experiments, by the way. We didn't have syringes until the 17th century. And the servant started to swoon, and there was a moment when it looked like the servant was about ready to die. And um, whether that specifically um, is what got Wren to stop doing his medical experiments, or whether it was the fact that the fire um, would soon break out and he would be called upon to help redesign um, London, we don't know. But um, clearly this begins this whole question of, okay, the heart is not what we thought it is. And maybe the heart is not, can, and blood is not specifically linked to the soul. And perhaps um, we need to be looking elsewhere for that organ of knowledge. And of course, that's gonna move us toward the brain. I do have animal and human here. That's another story that I've told often, um, is this was also the moment of, of the first um, animal to human uh, transfusion uh, experiments. So that brings us to another person who's rethinking things, and that would be Rene Descartes. And of course we know Descartes through the cogito, I think, therefore I am, and there's a lot more that we of course should be talking about, I'm just gonna speed through Descartes. 
But um, Descartes starts to wonder about, um, you know, can, where is the soul, right? Um, is the soul, okay, so for rethinking the heart, he actually does, in one of his treatises, he does sort of this metaphorical um, um, heart surgery, if you will, where he says, don't trust me. I'm going to show you. If we were to open the heart, right, and then and he takes the reader through a very meticulous dissection of a heart. Um, but don't trust me, I'm going to show you. Descartes wondering from the heart to the head, where is the seat of, of reason? Where is the seat of the soul? And he plays with this idea and becomes quickly attached to it is that the soul is absolutely not embodied, right? Um, and he suggests um, through, in many ways, I mean, these blood transfusion experiments and other vivisections that they were doing. Um, Descartes starts with the concept that um, there are differences between animals and humans, very clearly. We have the power to speak, we have the power to think, we have the power to reason, we have a soul, right? Um, uh, he wasn't universally accepted, um, um, and still is not now. Many people, especially animal rights people, loathe Descartes for all the right reasons. But he starts to um, um, spe uh, speculate that maybe humans and animals are simply similar machines, right? And here this is sort of fun because that this time period around Descartes and, and as you move toward the 18th century, you'll see a lot, a lot more uh, automatons, right? And this idea maybe the duck is just, maybe we can actually create a duck. Maybe here too we can create a human being. I love this one. It's literally through, this is a 1683 out of um, sort of what would be the equivalent of science, right, or nature for the 17th century, the Jean uh, de Savant in, in, in France. It's these ideas that, okay, well, if humans are just sort of hydraulics, pumps, and tubes, um, then maybe we can, you know, we can even see here. And, and it's very interesting um, as he's playing around about this idea of the rectangular abulae, too, right, is that somehow. Um, not Descartes, but the person um, who's, who's looking at because you see this very similarly in 16th century um, images of sort of the retinue abulae as a way of, of distilling to be able to get the blood up to the blood or the vital spirit up to the, up to the brain. But what I love, again, playing with this idea of hydraulics is right here. Uh, and I have a full description of what these are. These are lungs, right, which are bellows. Um, here are more tubes, and then that, of course, is the male member. Um, and it's clearly specified in the um, details is that it's it's to be made of a soft leather, so that um, it, then it can it can inflate and, and not inflate in different molecules. I think it's very funny. But um, so here already we're starting to move. We don't know it yet, but we are starting to move toward the brain. Descartes got a problem though, right? Um, Descartes is still attached to the idea is that reason. Um, Reason and the soul are not embodied, but they are in the body, right? And so he he continues the notion that all of this is still located in the ventricles, right? What a perfect way is you can have this sort of ethereal, you're not quite sure what it is, but you can have it in body but not quite embodied if you put it in the ventricles. And he has this thorny problem. Okay, well we know though, we know that when um, when we have thoughts that are troubling, is that our heart beats, right? Or our hands get sweaty, or we have these we have these emotional reactions that then get um, anchored in the body. And he tries all different types of ways to reconcile this. And one of the things that he does is he says, okay, there's a gland. He actually he and others put it in the wrong place. Um, there's a thing called the pineal gland, and he has this idea is that really what the pineal gland does it's it's almost like a little bit of a sensor, right? And so when um, the when the spirits um, in the uh, ventricles are sort of troubled or sending some sort of signal is that then it will hit this sort of fan, right, and signal the physical reaction in the body. Um, Descartes, keep in mind, um, this stuff is pretty um, innovative for his period. In fact, the Harvey um, was loathed by many people. They, the circulation was just a crazy concept, particularly by the French. Um, Descartes was exiled, right? Um, because that is the hold um, 
um, that the, the notions around Galen and Aristotle, Hippocrates, uh, um, I'm sorry, uh, Hippocrates held in the, in the 17th, 17th century in the Renaissance. So enter Wilkes, right? Contemporary of um, uh, Wren, Wren who, um, and also a student of Harley, right? Um, they're all part of this, out of this group out of Oxford. And he decides that he's going to start taking a look at the brain because really what he's doing, when he get, before he gets the brain, what he's doing is he's looking at Harvey's ideas of, of circulation, right? And they're continuing to test these ideas of circulation and trying to figure out, now the thing is, is how does, does blood get to the brain? How does it get to the brain? Um, Vesalius and others are now saying that there's no such thing as a reta mirabile in humans, but what does this mean? So he begins there with that question, with the heart now fully called into question. And we're in the depths of the scientific revolution, 1664, um, and again, he's unlike um, Galen, but most definitely along the trajectory of Vesalius, Harvey, um, really needs to have physical evidence. I determined not to pin my faith on the received opinions of others, nor on the suspicions and guesses of my own mind, but for the future to believe nature in ocular demonstrations. Therefore, thenceforward, I betook myself wholly to the study of anatomy, and as I did chiefly inquire into the offices and uses of the brain in its nervous appendix, I addicted myself to the opening of heads especially. I love that quote. <laughs> I addicted myself to the opening of heads especially to inspect as much as I was able frequently and seriously the contents. Okay, so we know that Willis is praised as the father of neurology, right? And enter Willis. Um, yes, okay. One of the things that we do need to be really careful of is that he's still part of this group, right? Um, yes, Willis does um, articulate um, the difference between the cerebellum and the cerebrum, and involuntary functions and higher cognitive functions. He also gets this idea of nerves, right? What are, what, what, what's going on in these nerves? And then, of course, he's famous for the circle of Willis, right? The arterial structure that uh, that you know, allows the blood to move. Um, I'll, I'm looking at the surgeons here. I'm getting all nervous. So, um, um, but there's so much more to it. What he goes back to this idea that bedeviled um, Galen, right? Galen suggested, for all practical purposes, is that animals and humans were identical, right? Um, he wasn't dissecting humans. All of his examples on human I mean, he's got a book that's called On the Human Body, and he's using only animal models, right? Um, so it's, it's also bedeviling Descartes. What, what, what is the distinction between animals and humans? It's bothering as well. Uh, and then, of course, when we get to Christopher Wren and those uh, transfusion experiments, right? Can we transfuse animal blood into humans? Um, already, that is moving us out of the idea of that somehow uh, the soul is in the body, um, and specifically in the heart, right? Um, because if, this, if there were something about the soul being in the heart, um, the heart is associated with the blood. If we were to transfuse animal blood into humans, then we'd have some problems, right? Um, because we, uh, that allows Descartes to say, no, animals and humans um, are similar because it's just changing the oil in a car. He wouldn't say that, of course, because cars don't exist. But, um, so Willis discovers when he's doing his dissections, he, he makes a point, he goes, you know what? Actually, these brains are more or less similar. Um, we have shown by comparing the corporeal soul of the brute with the rational soul of the man, what di vast difference there is between them. Perhaps it might be to the purpose to compare the brains of either and to observe their difference, differences. Okay, so this, this is sort of typical 17th century um, uh, rhetoric here, because at first I was like, wait, is he saying they're the same, or are they saying they're different? We have shown by comparing the corporeal soul of the brute with the rational soul of man what vast difference there is between them. Perhaps it might be to the purpose to compare the brains of either and to observe their differences. So he's using the we, the we, which will be the, the um, his colleagues in the Royal Society, and then it's more of a historical we. But this anatomy being elsewhere made by these colleagues, we, have, we me, um, have noted little or no difference in the head of either. And this is interesting because we get this we, which is more of a scientific we. It's neither me 
or you, it's, it's all of us, right? Um, but we have noted little or no difference in the head of either as to the figures and exterior conformations of parts. What he does, does notice is that there are differences in the sizes um, of the various parts. And that leads him to think, okay, if animals have, um, uh, so, so if, the, if the portions of, of, of reason, those places in the cerebrum that we associate with reason are bigger in humans than they are in animals, what does that mean? Aha, aha, aha. It's not about, it's not about the ventricles, right? There's something that is actually embedded in the flesh itself, right? In the brain, brain um, itself. And so then he begins, you know, to continue, you know, this, uh, he, he um, why do I have the serious name? Oh, there's the serious. So then he starts, well, this starts to think to himself, all right, um, there's a difference, but there's not a difference. I'm not really into this ventricle idea. Um, I'm definitely not into Descartes, right? Because he's just, he's completely refuting Descartes in that regard. He also has, he also calls into deep question the humors. And following along with Harvey, um, absolutely calling into to question Galen. So then he starts to wonder, maybe the brain is like a glassy alembic with a sponge laid upon it, as we do used to do the highly rectifying of the spirit of wine. Then he goes and goes and sort of does this odd flip, where it's like, OK, so the blood goes up to the brain, and it goes through what will later become the circle of Willis. Does that sound familiar? It sounds a lot like the resting parabola to me. Um, and then what happens is by going through um, this, this process, the, it becomes distilled, distilled, right? The spirit gets distilled. It, that spirit then gets moved to the nerves. And that's what, how the brain works, right? Um, so it's at once really different than what we've seen before. Um, um, Descartes actually didn't make any of that connection about about the nerves in and of themselves being something so critical to what what the brain does and the brain dictates the nerves. What Descartes starts all these, these little tubes with little pulleys, right? Is that there'd be a fire and and I would step on the fire, but then I would I would register in my mind that there's a fire and then somehow through the through that registering there'd be like little pulleys, because we're in the machine thing, and then my leg would go right. That's a very different model than what we're going to see with Willis. Um, so I take exception to the fact that we're calling Willis or the modern, you know, the modern neurologist. Yes, he coins the term neurology, um, the science of the, of the nerves. Um, but really, he looks awfully a lot like an alchemist in a way, right? And that should also not be surprising because who's one of his friends is Robert Boyle. Again, we call Robert Boyle the great father of chemistry. It was in the 90s, it, you, wouldn't have, you would have thought that the sky was falling because there were historians of medicine who were saying that Boyle actually you know, had a very, very strong connection to alchemy. And, um, um, and that was sort of part of what he did, particularly at a time when the distinction between alchemy and chemistry um, had really not been fully formed. So at once, yes, we can call um, Willis, the father of early neurology, yes, we can say that he enters the stage at a time that's right for us to be considering the brain, but also it's very clear that we couldn't have had Willis if we didn't already start with Vesalius, go to Descartes, through Harvey, right, throw in some Wren, add some Boyle, right, and then we get to Willis. So one of the things that I just wanted to end with is this whole idea of souls, right, and spirits, and I said, you know, a circle indeed. Um, so much of what, as we are in our neurocentric moment, right, um, what strikes me um, is that all of these discoveries um, were made because of a fundamental question. What does it mean to think? What does it mean to be human? What does it mean to not be human, right? And then, um, given the time period, which was very much steeped in, in questions of religion in the church, what is the soul? Where does the soul exist, right? Um, how does the soul exist? One of the things that I do think about is, you know, Galen 
persevered for millennia, right? And, until certain new questions started to come into um, into being asked. And as we enter now, which will be soon, you know, several soon, um, many many years of the neurocentric mode. Um, are there new questions? Are there other questions where we may be able to find um, different types of discovery? Because it, at least in my mind, pun, um, uh, I don't see these big questions about what it means to be human, what it means to um, um, feel, and what it means to have a soul in a lot of these modern neurological studies that we do. Is we're really at the Galenic moment of, of you know, I see something and it's a response. You are, because we see this in fMRI, this is who you are. This is how your machine works. And it could be a really interesting thing for us to move back and to ask some of these simple but completely horribly complicated questions when it, when it comes to the human conundrum and what kind of discoveries we might make going forward around the brain. There you have it. types of cultural models around um, understanding um, bodies and desecration of bodies. Um, you can think about some of the early um, uh, in Greco-Roman myths, right? I'm trying to remember who this is. Is the most horrible one where um, uh, the brother the brother is dead and then he is drugged by horses and the sister can't bury him. Which one is that? Um, Antigone. Antigone. And, and, and the whole horror of that idea of what you're doing to this into this body, right? There must have been battles where guys got their heads. Oh, certainly. Too, yeah, oh, yeah. So they might have seen some. Oh, I know that. I mean, and think about the Middle Ages as well. I mean, the amount of accidents, the amount of violence. I mean, Middle Ages all the way to our modern period, right? So it's not that interiors of bodies were not being seen, right? Um, they, they were just not being seen um, from the same type of empirical mode that we might think that they could have should have. Right? Again, I'm not an expert on, on antiquity when it comes to bodies and stuff, but that's my lay explanation for it. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I was sort of interested in the uh, sort of, I guess, tension, or maybe there's not one there, but between sort of the mechanical model of the, of the body mm -hmm. and then the alchemical model of the mind that is there. Is this, is this my 21st century approach, thinking that they're kind of at odds with each other at the same time, or do they, do they, you see what I'm saying? I feel like there's something really interesting there that I don't know how to answer. Um, I'm looking at the other person in here. Oli, what are you thinking? I wasn't, um, I Yeah, no. It seems like all the songs. I don't think they're. Soul. Yeah, they're not antithetical. Right. They're not antithetical, and and, um, and I can't quite put my finger on why yet. Um, let me think on it, Chris. Yeah. Okay. So I think about the sort of the natural magic aspect of alchemy, where things happen, but we don't know exactly why. Mm -hmm. But then there's also the mechanical that we we actually we can we have the we have the levers and we're aware of the levers. And maybe that's what it is. I, I mean, I feel like there's something there, you know, the whole idea that there are all of these mysteries that we can't control, but we really want to try to control in the early modern period, right? If we just get the right recipe, right, with the alchemists, is that, is that somehow or another we can, we can have, there it is, that we can, we can figure out how to get the purification, we can get through, through this notion of the philosopher's stone, highly simplifying alchemy, which is extraordinarily complex. But at the same time, you get through the entire idea of Willis, the idea of distillation, right? Um, Willis tends toward mechanism, to be absolutely sure, but then we can take a look at just how alchemical um, much of this stuff is. Um, Descartes, that's an interesting question. Yeah, yeah Elvi? Elvi, you guys have something? I had a quick question on. Uh, the, the period of a second video between um, 
group, animal, man, um, or between individual humans, and when we start also associating that with like race, either intelligence, capacity, or skill, or environment. Mm -hmm. In this time period, are we looking at some of these anatomical comparisons as also representative of expressive human characteristic comparisons? Like the idea like a very brain smart person, or some of the models along those lines. Like Not yet. Making these kind of comparisons. Now, when does that type of intra um, I think, well, it's, it's not that when, you, so when you're talking about race and difference, um, it, um, a lot of people say that race didn't exist until the 18th century. I don't, I don't yeah, necessarily that's believe that. Well, like but, yeah, um, you, I mean, what you do, it's, the model that's operating here is more of, a, of an environmental model, right? Um, but there are real differences um, among human beings, but um, it's, it's largely um, because of, of humors, and those humors are necessarily um, uh, connected to environmental modes of you know where they are, and it's really only until we get to the 18th century around Maupertuis, right, and the natural histories that, I, if I'm understanding you correct, uh, you're, where we start to get the idea of of difference being distinctly and unchangeably embedded in bodies, right? Is that was that? Yeah, yeah, I'm curious about that, but I'm just comparative between species in a sense. Mm -hmm. uh, they're starting to think about species. Actually, what, the, the comparison is more um, among class, right? Um, and, right. And, and lineage. Mm -hmm. Hold on. Uh, my question is a little bit like that, just taking it to the national level. Mm -hmm. From country to country, the perception of the brain, the heart, nationally, or whatever the country border would have been at that time, so the perception and the practice. So in each country, was there kind of a cultural or a country practice, the way that they would perceive something and the way they would implement this practice to hear or to treat or discuss in each mm -hmm. country? And I think you know, where's the world in, you know, these are, you know, a high level of people having these ideas of right, sharing right. it, but it seems like there were you know, people who maybe go to France or like England or England um, I don't. I don't think that there's a real. Uh, there's, to my knowledge, there's no real distinction at this time period. Is that um, so and so, and such and such culture? They think differently because their brains are different. That's for sure. Um, no, no, I meant you know the way the medical practice. Oh yeah, medical not practices. practices. Yeah. yeah, and so as a, a, that was a preliminary to what be a larger thing. Because I don't see that many cultural uh, medical medical treatises. If I've got an Italian um, treatise versus a French Italian treatise or uh, an English treatise, um, what you will see largely when I'm thinking about the herbals and probably is is you'll see different plants because it's in a different area, right? Um, you will also see, of course that's the old world, and then there'll be sort of a befuddlement of what do we do with all the new world stuff like you know coffee and um, what else? Uh, and tomatoes and, and turkeys, which I love. Turkeys in French, it's coke d'Inde, which means um, means um, cock of India, right? Well, coke yeah, okay. um, so there's a befuddlement of okay, so what 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 does this mean, and then what are the medical purposes of this? And maybe it's poison, maybe it's an aphrodisiac. What does this mean? Thank you for being here. Thank